Um, my name is Kevin Mather. Welcome. Uh, pleasure to have you here today with us for Mapping Your Supply Chain is Essential. Um, this is being presented in partnership with World Trade Center Denver, um, and we're very glad to be partnering with them on this as well. Let me introduce very quickly our two, our uh, moderator and our uh, speaker today, uh, Dave Mangelstorff and David Chevalier. A um, couple of brief announcements, and then we'll get into that. So today is um, part of a series on um, supply chain. And once again, being presented in combination with World Trade Center Denver. On February 25th, um, there'll be another webinar, which is Global Supply Chain Management. Take a look at our website for that. We'll also put the link to those in the chat later on. And then on March 10th, there'll be actually a course in supply chain mapping, which is an opportunity to gain a little bit more in-depth knowledge about the subject that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's event, and that's AIT Worldwide, a fabulous um, uh, logistics and freight forwarder. If you haven't worked with them before, definitely somebody you would want to consider adding to your quiver of, supply, of um, logistics folks. Now, let me introduce our two uh, speakers today. First, our moderator is Dave Mangelsdorf. He's Vice President of Operations for Pasco Scientific, responsible for engineering, procurement, manufacturing, and fulfillment. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Dave at Pasco Scientific, great professional. He's got a 25 plus year track record um, in companies ranging from 3 million to 2 billion and has managed through rapid growth and expansion as well as sharp downturns and retractions. Um, we also have with us uh, David Chevalier. Um, oh, wait, David Chevalier, sorry. Um, David has spent his entire career in technology. Uh, his career has been at IBM, Dell, Aruba, Juniper, Brocade. Solid understanding of the interoperability of mission critical systems. He is the VP of Worldwide Field Operations at Resilink, and he applies his understanding of digital transformation, supply chain risk management, cybersecurity experience to scale Resilink's customer success. In addition, David has built and managed eight worldwide software startup companies, and David is joining us today from Atlanta. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Dave Magelsdorf and to David. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate that. Uh, so David, really appreciate you spending time with us today and sharing your thoughts with the group. Um, you now, as uh, leaders in supply chain, I think you'd agree this past year has been really one of the most turbulent we've seen, especially uh, in the area of, of impact on business continuity disruption. Um, on, on Resilink's end, what was 2020 like, really, especially in terms of what you saw from your clients and the industry as a whole? Well, indeed, Dave, uh, disruption is the word of the day, no question. Um, and uh, thank you for having me today. And thank you to everybody that's on the line. I thought before I got started that you would be interested in who's on uh, the webinar with us today. 31% of the attendees are from education. Uh, personally, that's an all time high for all the webinars that we do, but it's a key indicator uh, what a hot topic this is. And this is filtering to our schools uh, and more and more of the, uh, the children these days are getting educated on this topic. 24% of you are from hard goods manufacturing, moving things around the globe. And uh, the remaining uh, groups of life sciences, technology and consulting uh, all tie at 15%. So certainly worldwide interest uh, one of my good friends, the CEO of Aon Insurance, says it best. Um, supply chain has gone from an afterthought to front and center. So everybody on this call right now is at the active center of what's going on uh, in the universe. If you believe that the healthcare workers are our first line of defense, like I do, then we're all the second line of defense because we're keeping the world economy going as all these disruptions take place. But consider for a minute, what did happen in 2020 and what's still happening? 2020, 28 named storms, an all time high, 11 of those found their way to US soil, Four of those, and it seems like the pipe to get into the United States is in the Gulf of Mexico, just the east of the Bay of Campeche, 
And then the landing point is somewhere between Pensacola and Brownsville, uh, Texas, uh, an interesting phenomena. Four of the 11 storms that hit the US were catastrophic in nature, costing billions of dollars in damage and hundreds of lives. Um, at the same time, 5.5 million acres burned to the ground in just three states, Colorado, Arizona, and California. And not to mention a worldwide pandemic at the same time. Yesterday was a sad milestone. I'm sure everybody saw it. Uh, America uh, eclipsed its 500,000th death. There have been 2.5 million deaths around the world. And it continues and, and uh, it, you know, it's kind of up for grabs how many variants there'll be in the coming year. Now, let's get a little closer to our world. 97% of 600 CPOs, chief procurement officers that were surveyed recently said, we experienced major disruption in the entire business and business continuity. 63% um, of uh, those polled said they're planning large scale changes to the enterprise based on what happened in 2020. Um, 65% said they're now turning away from globalization. I'm gonna come back to that a little later in the call because these, these uh, terms nearshoring and onshoring really don't happen overnight uh, if you're not prepared with uh, some type of strategy. So just because we had a catastrophe or two or three, uh, you can't make those changes and those pivots quickly. Um, and then I'll, I'll end with this data point um, 43 percent of the executives uh, surveyed said we haven't seen the worst of it yet which is a, a starling almost half uh, think that uh, something worse is coming down the pike so very interesting times that we live in uh, and, and getting to mapping um, if you're not doing that as the foundation of a supply chain strategy you won't be able to adapt to what may be coming and certainly had a, a rougher uh, uh, 2020. We had uh, one of our customers, interesting anecdote, who stepped forward at the end of the year and said, we didn't miss a single shipment in our technology company during COVID by and large because of Resolink. And that gets us into the, uh, the mapping discussion. So kind of our uh, quick 50,000 overview of what happened in the last year. That's a lot, that's a lot for sure. Um, uh, so did, can you go a little deeper and tell us a little bit more what supply chain mapping really is? Yeah, so well-defined at a, a fundamental level, it's understanding your entire supply chain, certainly your first tier suppliers, and then their suppliers and the relationship that all three of you have. So even, even some of the largest enterprises that I talk to, let alone small and medium-sized businesses, are telling us, you know what? We're not really sure where, where all of our first-tier suppliers are. Yet at the same time, I talk to executives every day that say, we would like to understand where our third and fourth, and I even talked to one executive this morning, they wanna map everything down to the ninth tier supplier, which is amazing. And if you think about mapping, let's say everybody on this call was gonna to drive to Grand Junction with me after this call. We didn't have GPS, we didn't have a map, but somehow we were gonna figure out how to get there. That's what you're doing with your supply chain and your business continuity. If you're not mapping out either a process or a strategy for where all those suppliers are and their relationships. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with a story that kind of puts this into a, a, a really sharp lens. Um, I spoke with an automobile executive uh, last week who said he was having a hard time getting fuel filters for the cars that they manufacture. And I dare say everyone on this call has driven one of those cars at one time in their life. Now think about what a fuel filter is. It's an aluminum canister and inside the canister is a paper filter. Of all the places in the world where this manufacturer could get their fuel filters made, the city was 
Wuhan, China. And he, he went on to tell me, think about a fuel filter. It's got paper in it. The paper comes from Seoul, South Korea. The pulp for the paper comes from Taiwan. And the trees to make the pulp, to make the paper that goes in the fuel filter are a Javanese country because of the specificity of this particular paper and its characteristics. That's what a supply chain map is. Knowing that you're in trouble in Wuhan and you have other parts that are going to Wuhan from other parts of the world to assemble what you need and finally find its way to Detroit, Michigan. Right, right. And, and so why is this so vital to, to, to know that? It sounds like a very big exercise potentially. Uh, why is it so critical? Yeah, that's a good point, Dave. And it, and it could be, um, I guess I could, I could answer this by my daily conversations. I had a conversation with another executive uh, over the weekend on the tennis court, quite frankly. And he said, yeah, he knows the business that I'm in. And he said, hey, look, we're, we're interested in installing this solution that's going to give us great visibility. And then his words, great data harmonization. And I said, well, that's why most people take the step to do mapping. They want visibility into their worldwide supply chain, where all of the suppliers are, where their various locations are, their plants, their warehouses, distribution centers, et cetera. And they want the data with the ERP system generally harmonized with the supply chain uh, data that they have visibility to. And I looked at him and I said, Mike, congratulations. You're about to install 10 year old architecture. Because 10 years ago, when we founded Resolink, that's exactly what people were interested in visibility and data harmonization. That's still important. There's no question about it. But I'd go so far as to say those are table stakes now, those are the bare minimums that you have to have. And that'll allow you to react to what just happened. But in a few minutes, I'm gonna talk about where the technology and the market is going and how do you install best practices solutions, not just those tools that give you visibility and data. Yeah, look, look forward to hearing that part. Um, before we get to that, can you, can you give us some examples of some successful mappings that you've been involved with? Yeah, sure. Um, as I just mentioned, our company goes back 10 years, so I could pick any, any year. There have been uh, uh, catastrophes along uh, the way in that journey. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, Hurricane Maria of 2017. Now, those of you that uh, recall that hurricane, it ripped through the Caribbean and fundamentally decimated Puerto Rico. They're still recovering in Puerto Rico. Um, one of our large companies in the life sciences business uh, had several plants that those of you that don't know, it's a huge hub for the assembly and manufacture of uh, life sciences paraphernalia, whether it be PPE, the gear that uh, our healthcare workers uh, wear or some of the plastic and, and uh, uh, other devices that they, they sell to hospitals and patients. Um, because of the tool set they were using, it happened to be Resolink, they were able to see the hurricane coming. So now we're changing from visibility and data to prediction, which gives you the ability to look out what should we be doing, not what just happened. So as Hurricane Maria came ripping up through the Caribbean, one of the executives at this company was able to pull out his smartphone get an alert on the phone. The technology then opened up a war room as to what they should do about it and how many suppliers were going to be affected in the path of the hurricane. This is all predictive. And then it automatically opened up a collaboration center so that her people could start communicating with the suppliers that were located in the path of the hurricane, primarily on Puerto Rico. And they immediately made moves before the hurricane even hit the, the island. And think about the, the uh, economics behind making these changes to alternative suppliers, et cetera. Everybody was scrambling for 
life sciences gear and products and solutions. And as you might expect, uh, the supply changed uh, the demand and the demand changed the economics overnight. Uh, people were running to Mexico to try and get similar uh, products, et cetera. And of course the prices uh, started to inflate. So that's one small example. Uh, I can give you another example of COVID. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, a lot of you may not know, but uh, uh, Wuhan is famous for about five or six different product lines. Watches, electronics, bicycles. I talked about fuel filters. Um, this particular global electronics firm had 20 different plants in, within several kilometers of uh, Wuhan. What we were able to do with similar uh, uh, event notification, we call that uh, solution event watch, was send messages to their smartphones, let them know round about November of 2019 that there is a flu-like virus that's being reported has similar characteristics to pneumonia, hasn't been given a name yet, but it's affecting an area where you have over 20 different plants and suppliers. What would you like to do about it? Similar event, it opened a war room. The war room described best practices that should take place because they knew those suppliers were mapped to that area. What alternatives were either local or around the world so they could make those moves immediately. It opened up a collaboration center so that his commodity managers and category managers could immediately start communicating with what's going on in China and make the necessary decisions. Didn't miss a beat because of that predictiveness uh, and, and the view into his uh, supply chain. So a couple of examples of uh, catastrophic avoidance. That sounds pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. Um, so let's say I'm not a IBM or a General Motors or someone with a real massive supply chain. Why, why is it still important for, for me to map my, net, my network? You know, I, I, I guess I could almost uh, answer the question by saying it's probably even more vital to you because I think about, you know, IBM is one of our great customers. It's uh, coincidental that you mentioned that enterprise. Uh, 60,000 suppliers, six zero, 60,000 that they have mapped, they understand their suppliers, suppliers, and those suppliers, et cetera. Um, but if you're not IBM and you're not General Motors, my guess is you don't have 60,000 suppliers. Maybe you don't have 200 suppliers. Maybe you have 20 that matter. And if those aren't mapped out succinctly, I would think you're a little bit more exposed and a little bit more at risk uh, without the necessary tools and the uh, uh, technology to help you get good visibility into your uh, supply chain. So I, I think, uh, Mapping is vital and history will show that it's the fundamental building block before you can have any answer to supply chain risk mitigation. Okay. So if I'm a smaller to medium sized company with, you know, not, not a ton of resources, how do I get started doing this? What do I do? Yeah, great question, Dave. Um, our best practices, and we, and we do this every day with the small companies, uh, very, very large global companies, all of the logos of which everyone on this uh, phone call would know. Um, most of our customers get started with their top 10 spends. Um, that's where, uh, in, in fact, for, for most of our suppliers, think about your top 10 spends to the 23 people that have joined us today. Um, and think about the, the, not only the, the spend that you have with those suppliers, but the revenue that comes from those top 10 spends. While you may only uh, spend, I had this conversation also last week, while you may only spend 40 million with that particular supplier, that supplier could represent 4 billion in revenue because it's the smallest part or the smallest skew that could have the greatest impact. Um, something worth talking about at this point is the semiconductor shortage. 
Who isn't being affected by that if you're in the electronics or automotive business? A typical auto today has at least 40 onboard semiconductors. Some of the more advanced and top of the end of cars, up to 150 semiconductors on board. I spoke with the CPO of another worldwide auto manufacturer. He said, David, right now I have more demand for an automobile than I have supply. And he chuckled to himself and he said, typically that sounds like a really good problem unless that problem rests squarely on your shoulders and you can't get semiconductors. And, and, and the semiconductor shortage was really the perfect storm of supply chain risk. At the same time that COVID hit, semiconductor manufacturers were changing their form factor for the automobile from the eight inch wafer to the 12 inch wafer. At the same time that the automobile industry was doing that, people were spending more time at home working out of the house, needing more electronics to support the work from home approach. And at the same time that was going on, most automobile manufacturers were ramping up the construction of electric vehicles, requiring more semiconductors. So this perfect storm intersected on the, on the chart at the same time, uh, this uh, worldwide shortage right now, and it's likely to affect all of us over time. But uh, uh, something, uh, something for you to consider, uh, even as a small business, it's important to get started in mapping somewhere, make the decision whether that's going to be a strategic map, i.e. near shore, onshore, or a process map. How do all the parts move around the world? What, where, what, what shipping lanes uh, off the west coast of Africa, uh, because that's where most hurricanes emanate from and then rip across the Atlantic and eventually hit us over here in the United States. What shipping lanes are most likely to be affected by the parts that I need manufactured where, uh, et cetera. So process and strategic are very important, but get started, get started with something, your top 10 spends, your top 10 strategic, um, this, this is vital. This is a, a relevant uh, topic today. Good, good advice, thank you. So earlier you mentioned newer technologies that can be leveraged. What are, you, what are you seeing in that area? So yeah, I think a, a great place to crescendo our discussion right now. So if one agrees that 10 years ago, and think back to the timing of uh, the turn of uh, 2020 and the turn of the century back in 2000 and what's happened since 2010, et cetera, almost everything in our world has changed, including uh, supply chain risk mitigation and resiliency. Where this market is headed is not away from visibility and data harmonization. It's all about visibility and data harmonization. In fact, nobody knows better than us at Resolink, we have the largest supplier data repository on the planet. We've been building it for 10 years. So we've got that down pat. Where we're turning the market and what our customers are latching on to. In fact, we just announced it uh, uh, this week, the predictive PO capability is, I'd like you to take nothing but three words from this discussion as to where we're headed. Uh, it's up to you as to how quickly you get there, but this is where the market is pulling us. Think about predictive, prescriptive, cognitive. And here, I'll give you an example. This is what I mean by that. Predictive, we see the hurricane coming. Prescriptive, this is what we think you should do about it. Not based on what everybody else is doing, not based on what the market is doing, not based on what your competitors are doing, based on your best practices in having seen this event before. We're working with a large, uh, uh, paper pulp company here in Atlanta, everyone would know who it is. They're concerned about the floodplains in uh, outside of the Gulf of Mexico, right? And that's where they grow most of their trees to make the pulp, et cetera. Uh, predictive says, once the hurricane hits, 
we have to prescribe what we should be doing about that event based on your best practices. And because this technology today is built on AI, ML, neural network, heuristic engines. Every experience that you have goes into the AI engine. It's cognitive and it learns over time. So that by this time next year, if similar events happen, think during hurricane season, the engine will be smarter about best practices than it is this year. So that's where we're headed, right? Not only visibility about what happened, but one of my life sciences executives told me the other day, I can learn all day long about what happened last week. I want to know what's going to happen next week. Uh, that's where the market is headed, where these technologies exist today and the economics are such that the ROIs could be 10 to 100x what you spend uh, to help yourself in, in supply chain mapping. Very good, very good. Well, we're gonna start taking some questions in a minute here. Uh, so I encourage our attendees, if you have questions to uh, submit them uh, in, the, in the chat there and I'll uh, tee them up for uh, David to address. Um, while folks are starting to do that, David, if you could kind of summarize the, the takeaway uh, that you'd like people to, to leave here with, uh, what would you say? Yeah, I, I don't want to be too esoteric, but what we're talking about reminds me of a story that everyone on this phone is familiar with. And believe it or not, it's Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland is walking through the woods and she comes to a crossroads in the woods. And in the center of the crossroads is a mirror. And in the mirror is Cheshire Cat staring back at Alice in Wonderland. And Alice in Wonderland says, I wonder which path I should choose. And Cheshire Cat says, that depends a great deal on where you wanna go. Alice in Wonderland says back, you know, I'm not really sure. Cheshire Cat says, then clearly any path will do. If you don't know where you're going with risk mitigation, with resiliency, with business continuity, with the security of your business, then any path will do. But my recommendation in spending this time with you is do something, right? Thomas Watson, the founder of IBM had a great quote. The worst thing of all is to drown in the middle of the ocean. Decide, make a decision. Um, and, and I'll leave you with where I began. Supply chain mapping is the first step in that thousand mile journey. That's how it gets done. Very good. Very good, appreciate that. So we've got a couple questions uh, in so far. First one is uh, a company supply chain can make a significant impact in promoting human rights, fair labor practices and environmental progress. One can assume a company focused on improving its supply chain sustainability in these issue areas has been even more impacted by the disruption brought on by COVID. Fewer alternatives for, for instance. Can you discuss the supply chain risk mitigation for such companies? I can. I'm glad that question came up. In fact, I was going to say, that's such a great question, Dave. I'm going to have you answered it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I'm glad it came up because everyone on this call can relate to that question. Do you all remember about three years ago, four years ago, when a large technology phone manufacturer, which will go unnamed, was making their phones in China and labor practices and human rights, et cetera, were being violated. That percolated to the top of the news for about a month. People are using technology like this since we also uh, provide alerts on events like riots, strikes, labor disputes, merger and acquisitions, uh, global macroeconomics, but more importantly, labor rights. We report on that. And we have customers that are just using us for sustainability and corporate citizenship. That's all they do with our tool because we're able to alert them which of their suppliers are in compliance, which are in non-compliance. And because we have the ability to map multi-tier down to the nth tier, we can tell them 
which of their suppliers, 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 suppliers are in non-compliance with the issues that they desire? So a great question, top of mind these days, uh, we can help. Thank you, very good. Do you have any advice on getting executive level buy-in uh, for supply chain risk management program like this? I do. There's one thing I know about executives, they're coin operated. <laughs> So if, if you can pull a business case together, in fact, many of, of us suppliers uh, for risk mitigation tools and software have these tools that show an acceptable or better than acceptable ROI, you'll have their ear. There is no question about it. And then uh, there's really only three ways to justify such technology. One is added value right? Are we making our people more productive? Are we keeping our suppliers in compliance as we just spoke on the last question? Are we averting catastrophic disruptions to the supply chain? That's one way. There's another way, cost avoidance and cost displacement. Because we install solutions like this, we're displacing other costs. And cost avoidance, here's a great, very simple example. Every customer and prospect I talk to every day, so I have 15 to 20 conversations a day, every one of the customers says, because we had a catastrophe and we didn't know it affected this supplier and it delayed our ability to deliver, we put everything on an airplane. Add those numbers up at the end of the year. You are in the multiple millions. Doesn't matter how small or how large you are. I'm not talking about the 800 pound behemoths. I'm talking about people that are building air conditioners for their local customers. If they miss a shipment, they put it on an airplane. That's the first default, right? You don't wanna be two weeks late on a shipment, et cetera. So there's all kinds of ways to um, to justify the cost and the returns are gargantuan. Gotcha, good. So you talked a little bit earlier about predictive analytics related to risk management. How, how would somebody learn a little bit more about that area? Well, I'm glad all the uh, educators are on the phone today. That's one way, of course. Um, another way is uh, I, I make a big vote for trying it, right? Um, you would be surprised how far we've come on the economics uh, versus when we started uh, 10 years ago in 2010. Um, but the economics to try uh, a predictive module and uh, our product family, like most in the uh, SAAS business today, is modularized. You can pick and choose like a cafeteria menu, which are the modules that mean the most to you. I mentioned uh, our customers that are using us just for corporate citizenship, compliance, um, sustainability. Um, they just pick those modules that help them in that mission. As it comes to the predictive module, that's a good place to get started. Great, great. Uh, do you have any advice uh, for how I might deal with uh, a tier one, my first tier supplier that does not wanna be cooperative and share with me who their suppliers are, you know, perhaps they're fearful that I might go around them and they would lose the business, but how do I get deeper into their supply chain if they're really not on board? That's a great question, Dave. Um, we did something, I think, from the get-go by luck or the grace of God or skill. We did, a, we did something really smart. Number one, we're openly architected. That's really important because we know we're going to have to be interoperable with every mission critical system you have, like your databases and your ERP systems, uh, et cetera. But uh, also, we call ourselves the LinkedIn of supply chain management. So suppliers opt in to the program and there's no charge on the part of the supplier. So if we have a customer, let's just pick ABC manufacturing and they want their suppliers to get on the program, there's no charge to the supplier or the supplier's supplier. We've thought about that. We've allayed those costs to our customers and to the suppliers, but they opt in on their own. With that model, we get north of 85% participation up and down the chain. That's pretty strong. Right. And yeah. the, other, the other thing that we do for our customers is we're the inventors of what we call the R score. 
the risk score based on a number of dimensions that our customers pick and choose. Is it global macroeconomics? Is it the finances of that particular uh, supplier? Is it their history, their deliverability? Are they in risk zones, political unrest, et cetera? You can create for each and every one of these suppliers an R score. In fact, it's become so cultural in our business that people are now on blogs and in publications bragging about their R score. Hey, I have a 7.3 R score with Resolink. It's kind of a cool thing, but that's a delivered value both to you and to your supplier, which kind of creates the environment where they really want to opt in to help you help your own uh, companies. Kind of cool. Great. So for, again, for some smaller companies thinking about getting into this, what, what, what do you think is gonna be the biggest challenge that they're gonna face? Gosh, I, I, I guess I look at it through the opposite lens and what, what is the risk to your company in not looking at this? You know, uh, take or leave Resolink. We'd love for you to check us out at resolink.com. We have great solutions up and down the chain at all kinds of economics. Um, one year, three year, five year subscriptions, et cetera. We have large uh, customers. We have very, very small customers, you know, paying us uh, uh, small dollars a year just to help them. Um, but I would say the risk to do nothing is extraordinarily high, uh, especially now, especially now. I mean, I, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. We've been open since May 1st of 2020. And in many ways, in the restaurants and the bars and, you know, getting your car fixed, et cetera, things are kind of sort of business as usual. It's not like that in California. It's not like that in New York or Florida where people are, you know, still locked down, et cetera. I talk to the UK every morning. Um, they are locked down. I mean, cannot leave your house. Uh, and they have curfews in the morning, curfews in the afternoon. We have no idea where this is going. The risk to do nothing is extraordinarily high. Uh, the cost to do something is extraordinarily low. Great. What's your What's your take on the you know, the reheightened trend in terms of reshoring and bringing manufacturing and supply chains back uh, to the U.S.? Uh, how feasible is that, really? Yeah, the, a, a great question. Again, as we started, um, that's not a that's not, I wouldn't call that a pivot point. That's not something you can do overnight. Now, uh, with supply chain mapping, much, much easier. The auto executive that I talked to that did map their uh, supply chain was able to pivot from Wuhan to Mexico in less than a week. That That's pretty strong. Um, but uh, gosh, you know, pivoting to uh, globalization and, and our uh, affinity towards getting uh, things made in Japan and China and Taiwan to uh, uh, near shoring and onshoring is difficult at best. Um, I'll give you an anecdotal story I think our customers tend to grab onto, you know, give me a real live example. Some of you may recall there was a massive fire in Asahi, Japan in the fall. It was extraordinarily massive. It happened in the middle of the night, Eastern Standard Time. One of our customers in Michigan got out of bed in the morning and by the time his feet hit the floor, he had a notice on his smartphone. 18 of his suppliers were affected. His people had already opened the war room, were invoking best practices on what to do. His people had opened up the collaboration center they were collaborating with Asahi Japan to find out who was affected, who was not, and making the alternative moves for the people that were affected. And for the ones that weren't affected, they were asking them about the delay on shipments because of the catastrophic fire. The ports were closed down. Um, just a number of things trickled down from that. Um, you know, there's a perfect example of getting started and how it could affect you immediately. And uh, that's real ROI. Um, this particular customer was an, uh, a provider to the auto industry for rubber and plastics, you know, seemingly a small thing, but as I mentioned, one innocuous part 
could stop an entire production line. So a you know, position that you, you don't want to be in. Yep. Yeah, I, I, had, I recall several stories back with the earthquake in Japan near the nuclear plant that uh, all of a sudden supply is constrained and only so many end customers are going to get the parts. And it's the customers that knew that third and fourth level of supply chain. They knew where to go with their checkbook or their uh, bag of cash to secure supply. And it was only the ones that had their supply chains mapped that knew where to go. Indeed, indeed. I mean, this is, again, I, I hate to be a, a, a nonchalant about it. These really are table stakes to keep the business going. Um, and again, you know, it's gone from an afterthought to front and center um, these days. Right. Well, David, I, uh, I want to thank you for sharing uh, your great insight with everybody. I think this was uh, very valuable. Uh, and very applicable, uh, as we've all seen in the last year, for sure. Uh, with that, Indeed. Kevin, yeah. Kevin, let me turn it back over to you. Thanks, Dave. All right. Perfect. And then I did see that there was one question from uh, Tucker. You had raised your hand. If you do have a question, if you can type it into the Q&A, we'll see if we can get it put in. Um, I want to thank, once again, um, David and Dave for joining us today and um, giving us a brief overview of supply chain mapping and why it's really important. And um, I think one of the things that I walked away with is really that it's not just for the big boys and that smaller companies really need to be looking at this in a serious way as well. Uh, here in the Sacramento area, there were a number of classic SMEs that I spoke with um, that had absolutely experienced disruption to their supply chain because of the pandemic. So this just really says that, you know, being proactive about that's very important. Um, also, let me just give a shout out to Dave uh, and Pasco Scientific. Pasco is a fabulous local SME manufacturer with business in, um, I think equipment installed in over a hundred countries worldwide um, and a global distribution network, really an accomplishment for, you know, a classic SME um, business. And it highlights the strength and the power of of international business um, in the region. Once again, thanks very much. Um, on February 25th, we'll be doing a session on uh, global supply chain management. Once again, in combination with our partner, World Trade Center Denver. And then on March 10th, we'll be doing the supply chain mapping, um, an actual training session. If you're interested in that, uh, come back to our website and definitely uh, stay tuned. We're looking forward to doing that. And then, um, David brought up the subject of AI, and on March 31st, we're going to actually have a panel that will be talking about really the development of AI and the implications for it in global trade, um, both on um, the technology side as well as on the labor side. So we think that'll be a very interesting conversation as well. And once again, last, thank you very much to our sponsor, AIT Worldwide. Uh, this session was recorded, and we will be taking and posting it online within a couple of days. So with that, and seeing no other questions, we'll say thank you and take care. Thanks Bye for having us, Kevin.